welcome to the first edition of uh, IADU from my foundation i hope uh, everyone is finding the program useful uh, my duty today is to talk about uh, cataract surgery with pseudo exfoliation and i'll quickly take you all through a couple of slides before i uh, go on to the video and uh, essentially the major challenges with pseudo exfoliation is first and foremost the poor endothelial count which very often gets missed out because unlike in fugue's endothelial dystrophy where you have these uh, evident gutte which you can see you are not able to see any such changes in the endothelium you may occasionally have some excess deposits but by and large it looks like a normal endothelium with maybe a slightly washed out appearance and it's only through a specular you really get to know and i'll allude to that point later meiosis is another challenge zonular weakness is very well documented with pseudo exfoliation the post operative period you may have iop spikes capsular phimosis is quite common and if not properly taken care of in the during intraoperatively you may have corneal decompensation as well so i'm just going to show a quick case of an 80 year old with uh, significant pxf and uh, grade 3 nuclear cataract had phacodonosis on the slit lamp examination but what i would not have picked up despite being a corneal surgeon uh, i is is that the patient would have had this kind of endothelial count it looked like a nearly normal endothelium but when you did a specular the count was only about 1000 so going on to the surgery itself uh, in all these cases uh, definitely i use a little bit of tripan blue uh, use a uh, high molecular weight viscosity so you can see that the cataract is fairly mobile and i'm having difficulty in initiating the rexis i do a, a initial small rexis with my uh, cystitome uh, 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 i try to complete it if there was more difficulty i would have switched on uh, over to the uh, forceps now i make a small nick in the initial uh area where i've made the capsular excess and try to enlarge it with using my forceps now you may not be able to achieve a complete circle in some of these situations and you enlarge it to the extent possible as the bag is moving around a little bit so you can do it in two stages as well so having enlarged it along one side i make a nick on the opposite side and enlarge it using the left hand and this actually reduces the stress on the uh, zonules as well as you're pulling it from the opposite direction i do a gentle hydro but after the hydro uh, multiple quadrant gentle hydro because i need a, a mobile uh, nucleus but i don't rotate it as that can cause some zonular stress and at this stage i uh, choose to uh, insert the capsular hooks these four capsular hooks should ideally be placed uh, uh, at equal distance from each other so that there is equal distribution and then you can rotate the nucleus and then go ahead and do the chops the advantage of having the capsular nucleus in place is that there is no progressive uh, zonular damage which happens when you're doing these chopping maneuvers and it's a reasonably dense nucleus and there will be some amount of stress which is conveyed to the uh, capsular bag and at the same time while you're drawing the pieces forward uh, there is less tendency for the bag to move when the capsular hooks are already in place now the next question is when do you want to use the ctr and it's very well said that a ctr must be used as late as you can but as early as you must and as soon as you start, uh, start seeing there will be a posterior zonular weakness as well and therefore the pc will keep surging up as you're doing your phaco emulsification and when you start seeing that once you evacuated the initial couple of pieces you have sufficient space to easily put in your uh, capsular tension ring and then you can go ahead with the cataract surgery with complete ease the advantage of now having the capsular tension ring in place is that it also uh, reduces the floppiness of the posterior capsule uh, from coming into your probe and you can do a safe uh, uh, phaco emulsification in the back mind you this is also a patient with a poor endothelial count and you don't want to do your phaco emulsification in the ac and this allows me to do a phaco emulsification in the back right up to the last piece so well, primarily because i now have a ctr also in place i go ahead and place a three piece lens in the back this provides additional support to the back along with the uh, ctr and after placing the lens in place i remove the capsular hooks generally these are patients who don't really have a subluxation it is just about uh, having a diffuse zonular weakness and if it is well handled intraoperatively these lenses are very well centered and generally don't require uh, any uh, cones or capsular uh, tension segments in these patients and uh, this patient uh, did quite well post operative as well this is just another video uh, highlighting the meiosis aspect of uh, associated with pxf i'm not going to take you all through the entire video but uh, 
these are patients where even if you have a four millimeter X where you can four millimeter pupil where you can actually do a safe uh, phaco emulsification. I still believe that capsular hooks uh, or or any uh, uh, pu sorry uh, iris hooks or any pupil expansion device should be used. The main advantage being that you can have a sufficiently large excess which you would normally not have when the pupil is small. And the additional advantage is you can constantly watch your uh, uh, bag, your zonules. If there is any additional weakness, you can insert a CTR at any point of time. And if your chops are not complete, in case you're having to maneuver a slightly larger piece, having this slightly larger rexus is useful and you're not transmitting any of these forces onto the capsular bag. So at any point with, with the PXF, even with a moderate pupil, I would definitely recommend uh, using uh, pupil expansion devices and uh, ensure you have a sufficiently large rexus before you go ahead with your phaco emulsification. So the take home message is examine the endothelium closely, probably do a specular in all cases if, uh, if possible, if you have it at your disposal. And the, I uh, feel combined use of capsular hooks and CTR can be very useful in these cases. And definitely using iris hooks and pupil expansion rings gives you a larger excess, reduces zonular stress, and definitely reduces the risk of postoperative uh, phimosis, which you can have very commonly with uh, PX cases. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Shreyas, for that comprehensive presentation. Uh, 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 Jeevan, can you comment? Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, a wonderful uh, presentation by Shreyas, and uh, beautiful points you have highlighted in these cases. I think one important thing which uh, he highlighted in the second case is to have uh, enough uh, pupillary uh, dilatation for these cases. And normally the pupils are uh, moderate in all uh, pseudo exploration cases. So devices, uh, I normally like in such cases to have iris hooks because you can uh, differentially you know, enlarge the pupillary areas, especially sub incisional area, which is so important that you can use the iris hooks uh, very nicely in such cases. And one thing I normally uh, do in all these cases, uh, put a CTR in all cases, despite having uh, to have a normal looking capsular bag. In all cases, I put CTR in these cases, normal CTR 11, 13 millimeter in adult cases. As you rightly pointed out, these patients do have higher chances of a capsular fibrosis and contraction. And I routinely have been doing for a, a part of a pseudo exploration in other cases also, like pediatric patient or a retinitis pigmentosa case. I do a, a multiple small radial mix in the you know, capsular axis after ending the surgery. So this breaks the circle of a, a rexus. And that makes when you have a contraction, it doesn't get fumosis. And uh, that is a, I found is a very good way to handle these cases. In fact, I had named it as a, Posted stamp uh, capsulotomy after surgery. It works wonderfully well because it enlarges the size also and breaks the ring. It works quite okay. Great. Um, Jagdish, should you like to, I mean, this point uh, uh, Shresh was talking about, about the association of endothelial uh, and the pseudo exploration, would you like to comment on that? I think uh, what, what Shreyas has pointed out is a very important point. So as clinicians, as corneal surgeons, we do go ahead and look at the corneal endothelial cells. We do have a healthy endothelium in these patients, but it's difficult uh, clinically to find out if, the, if these patients have uh, less endothelial counts. I think that in a few cases uh, who are very old, you do encounter a different sheen in the cornea where you would suspect a hyperreflectivity in the posterior stroma where you would with a slightly thickened desmase membrane, these are the cases where you can find less endothelial. You want to do a specular or a confocal to look at the less endothelial cell counts. But most of the times you, you tend to miss uh, low endothelial cells in these patients. And post-operatively also, uh, in spite of you doing a very great surgery, you do see some amount of edema in these patients and taking a little longer to recover. I think whenever you have old patients with PXF, I think it's a good modality to get a specular and make sure you use adequate viscoelastic during the surgery so that you don't end up with post-operative edema that stays for a very long time. Now, one small observation I have there, uh, uh, Dr. Jagdish sir and maybe Dr. Tikhalsa can also add on it, is that I feel compared to Fuchs, 
even though when the count is less, uh, probably physiologically these endothelial cells are better. And uh, very often, even though the count is around 1000, and uh, I've even taken the specular postoperatively for the patient, it came down to 800. But the patient's uh, cornea is absolutely uh, clear and uh, pachymetry is absolutely normal. There's no thickening. Possibly, I feel functionally they are better compared to the uh, fugues uh, cells with a similar count. I think you are right, uh, Sirius. Uh, these endotheliums are normally much healthier than a disease uh, fuchs endothelium. And I have had patients where you actually see these deposits in the endothelium, you know. You can see multiple uh, white deposits it. coming in these cases. But uh, very often these patients do have uh, glaucoma associated uh, in these cases, which may get accentuated in an uh, immediate post-op period. And a little bit of inflammation would have uh, been... Uh, been there in these cases. That may be cause for uh, you know uh, endothelial uh, dysfunction for some time. So we have to again look for you know rise of pressure in these cases. Apart from the routine cases, they'll have higher chances. So that is also important fact in these cases. IOP lowering uh, should be considered, and optic nerve status should be checked uh, if you can't see beforehand after surgery also, because that may be a factor for a poor visual outcome in these cases. Yes, there's a valid point, like we do a uh, lot of uh, glaucoma surgeries with pseudo-exfoliation and in spite of a higher pressure, these corneas do quite well. Uh, that is an important point and at least I have not been using uh, CTRs unless it's a, a, in a pseudo-exfoliation routinely. I think it's very important for us to go back and start using it in at least in denser cataracts where there's going to be more of a manipulations on the nucleus. I think that should become mandatory for all of us. I think another I think point Chitra brought out a very nice point about the glaucoma because many of these patients have chronic open angle uh, glaucoma and then you have to assess that uh, pre-op and then maybe re they require a combined surgery. Now one point I wanted to bring out is we see a lot of many of the exfoliation cases where I even put in a CTR uh, after 10 years, 12 years, they're all coming with the whole bad CTR complex uh, IOL dislocations. Uh, so, uh, I'm wondering now whether routinely we should use a three-piece lens for all pseudo-exfoliation and also the technique of uh, putting the three-piece IUL in the sulcus and capturing, doing a posterior uh, uh, capture of the capsulorexis. I think Dr. Deepak has some experience in that and maybe he can comment on that. Uh, I agree with, uh, am I audible sir? Yeah, yeah, very well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I agree with Dr. Shikani, sir, because I have had experience for about last six years where I've used the technique of IOL trap technique where the CTR goes into the bag and uh, the multi-piece lens hydrophobic technique goes into the sulcus with optic capture. Uh, we got amazing stability, in, especially in cases of generalized uh, zonular dehiscence, generalized weakness, as Dr. Shares was showing in the first case. The first case was an ideal case, more likely to dislocate in the later part of the thing. So in that, those situations, I think, uh, they're tailor made for these lenses where you have this hydrophobic lens in the sulcus with the optic going behind and the CTR supports the equator of the bag. Uh, we have an equatorial stretch and support by the uh, CTR and the tackiness of the hydrophobic lens, it just sticks on to the anterior surface of the uh, uh, capsule and this, this, comp this compensates for the posterior pull because of the laxity of the generalized weakness of the news. So this is a technique which I have found that it works well. The follow-up is not long, maybe six years, but they look the same. They are not worsened at least. So the key thing is sizing and centering of the rexus and using a multi-piece hydrophobic lens because the lens has to stick on to the bag. So once it sticks on to the bag, the haptics in the in the uh, in the sulcus they prevent it from going down. That is what is my uh, philosophy because we have seen Dr. David Chang and Dr. Lisa Brizer do this, and uh, this was I've been following six years follow-up, and it has served me well so far. Deepak, very interesting observation. I have seen a couple of videos on this also. But I just wonder, it's a progressive zonopathy that we are dealing with. And you place the haptics in the sulcus and create an optic action. Obviously, on the table, the lens is going to be quite stable. But how does that prevent the zonopathy from worsening? Uh, the zonules, it doesn't uh, 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 decrease the zonular weakness which is happening. What we are hoping is the lens which are not, the haptics are not uh, supported by the zonules at all. Zonules are independent. So zonules are way above the, uh, the haptics are above the zonules. And we are hoping that some amount of mild inflammation is going to anchor it like that. 
So something like the anchor is provided by the haptics. So it is totally Zonule independent support, what we're hoping for. So Zonules are not at all involved. The haptics are at a place above the Zonules. And uh, the equator stretch to prevent the phimos and other things is provided by the uh, ring. So this is what is uh, uh, the philosophy behind this. So the entire lens is not depend on Zonules. Some of part of it is above it and hopefully it's going to pull it up, keep it stretched. We'll let the queen of subluxated lenses uh, soon pick have the final say. Okay, so, you know, like the first case that we saw, beautifully illustrated, you know, using bimanual kind of cataracts, that kind of patient, I would definitely fix on, you know, two points. And if it looks pretty stable on the table, then I'll just put it in a CTR. So today, I prefer to, as you could say, to prevent subluxation, especially if the patient is not old. Uh, I completely agree with you, madam. I mean, uh, I was thinking of the same on table. Uh, whether to use uh, a CTS and uh, fixate on uh, two sides. But uh, I was hoping that this will outlive the patient. I mean, he was an 82-year-old man, and I thought uh, having put a three-piece lens, even if it starts subluxating, it can be converted into a SFIO link. Yeah, so one thing I would like to add is that I generally do a UBM before surgery, so that helps me to predict whether or not I will need to fix this patient so that I can counsel them appropriately. Mm -hmm. I think if we use a three-piece uh, IOL routinely later on also, if there is any subluxation, we can always do a, a fixation, either a glued IOL or a MNA for the same lens rather than explanting the lens. So that is also probably one of the things that we can keep in mind. Like I said, it's better to use a three-piece IOL for all these cases. I think it's a very important point you made, uh, Sri Ganesh, in the sense that except for the fact that it requires a slightly larger incision, a three-piece lens is far more versatile than a single-piece lens, whether placing it in the sulcus, optic capture, or fixing it down to the sclera. All these things it's uh, amenable to. So that's also my go-to in the sense, even though most often I use single-piece, whenever there's a compromised uh, situation, whenever the capsular back stability is in question, I go ahead and use a three-piece lens because I think uh, it's much more easier to handle it in different situations.